Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have John Ellers for a special webinar as part of our four-year anniversary webinars. We actually have 16 webinars all throughout the month of June. Uh, today's webinar, John's going to be talking about indicators for effective trading strategies. Uh, some of the bullet points real quick include uh, market data being fractal in nature, uh, spectral dilation, uh, aliasing noise, and uh, using Monte Carlo to uh, evaluate your trading system performance. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar posted on BMT sometime tomorrow, as well as YouTube. If you're watching the recording at a later date, do me a favor and give us a thumbs up on YouTube or fill out the feedback form on BMT. There is also going to be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation and you'll be able to ask your questions directly to John. And then when we're through with that, we're going to be giving away 10 autographed copies of John's book, Mesa and Trading Market Cycles. So stay tuned for the end of the webinar for that. The uh, quiz questions to win those prizes are going to be directly related to the content covered today. So you're going to want to pay very close attention to what John says, as those questions will be based on what he says today. All right, guys, with that, I'm turning things over to John. Okay, John, you should see uh, the option to share your screen again. Um, there we are. Yep, looks good. Thanks, John. Um, thank everyone for joining us, um, and uh, congratulations to Big Mike on his fourth anniversary. And uh, I guess we're all here to help him celebrate. Uh, I'm going to be talking about predictive indicators. Indicators in general do a pretty good job of documenting what's happened in history, but uh, how can I say this delicately? Um, their ability to predict the future where our trades lie is uh, yet to be documented. Um, so we're going to try to change that a little bit today and investigate the predictive nature of indicators and how we can make that happen. Before I begin, I'd like to read uh, the disclaimer. Uh, the information provided in this webinar is for informational purposes only. Trading is risky and it's not for everyone. Your trading decisions are your own and for a full disclosure doc statement, uh, please go to www.stockspotter.com slash in slash legal Dot ASPX. Uh, first of all, a little about me. I am ret retired. I'm retired as a senior engineering fellow from the Raytheon Company. I uh, got my uh, bachelor's and master's uh, from the University of Missouri and did my doctoral work at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where I majored in fields and waves and minored in information theory. So I started trading in the mid-1970s, and that was about the time that Wells Wilder brought out his book um, called New Concepts, blah, 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 blah. And in that book, he introduced uh, the RSI, which was intriguing, and I asked my broker, why did Wilder use 14 days in computing the RSI? And um, the answer I got back was, well, that's because Wilder said so. And you have no idea how uncomfortable that answer was to an engineer. So I started doing my own research and uh, the vector I went on was trying to investigate what I could measure in the market so that I could make dynamic adjustments to the RSI or stochastic or other indicators to better adapt to current market conditions. And that's why I came up with the MESA cycles measuring technique. Uh, MESA is an acronym. It stands for Maximum Entropy Spectral Analysis. So I've written four books on trading, um, and uh, they're available uh, through Amazon, etc. And um, John Wiley will bring in, be bringing out my fifth and, parenthetically, my last book this fall. Most recently, I am uh, the co-founder of StockSpotter.com. So let's get on to the good stuff. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, I have to talk about the theoretical basis of market structure before I can start taking it apart and analyzing it. 
And there are two main uh, constituents. First of all, aliasing noise. And I'll show you that aliasing swamps out uh, the signal information at short cycle periods. But I guess the larger question is, what is aliasing? Um, when I was a kid, we went to the movies, and we called them flicks because uh, they flickered. Uh, and, and they flickered due to having a fairly short uh, um, uh, frame rate or um, a, a low frame rate. And so you get the flicker between the, the individual frames. I, as I recall, it was like 16 times a second. Well, the upshot of that was when you saw a cowboy movie and the stagecoach went by, uh, the wheels on the stagecoach would appear to be turning backwards. That is an artifact of aliasing. And so when we're dealing in sample data, it's not like analog data. It is sampled, and uh, you get things like aliasing noise just by virtue of the sampling itself. So the wheels turning backwards are... Uh, one example, in, in our case, uh, we're dealing in random variables, and so we're folding noise back on itself due to the uh, sampling um, exercise itself. The other thing that we have to be concerned with is something that everybody knows about. Uh, the market data is fractal. If you take a daily chart and pull the labels off of it and substitute in a weekly chart, you can't hardly tell the difference. They're almost the same. So that means that, that uh, the swings in amplitude scale according to the time period or the sample size that you're using. So uh, uh, that's been known. Uh, the fractal people um, I'll call it uh, fractal replication. Uh, the people that follow Fibonacci will talk about the log spiral, and and they assert that the growth rate is 1.618. That's a golden ratio. Um, but uh, I'm not so hard over on constant numbers. But I just wanted uh, to view our. our to make you aware that the market is fractal, and I'll show you uh, that in, in some oncoming slides. Particularly, what can we do about these things? It doesn't do any good just to talk about it. Everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything. Today, we're going to do something about both aliasing noise, we're going to eliminate it, and how to address the impact of spectral dilation. And from having that background, now we're ready to talk about predictive indicators, anticipating the swing turning points. And uh, I think you'll find that instructive. And finally, I'll close with how best to evaluate uh, trading st strategy performance. So starting with the market as fractal, this is a pretty nice uh, uh, graphic that, that I like. Um, let's walk through it a little bit. The horizontal scale in, is in terms of frequency. So 10 uh, to the minus 1 is 1 over 10. So this is a 10-bar cycle. Uh, 10 to the minus 2 is 1 over 10 squared, or 100. That's a 100-bar cycle. 10 to the minus 3 is 1 over 10 to the third power, or 1,000. So that's a 1,000-bar cycle. So on the horizontal scale, we have frequency, the reciprocal of period, in a log scale. Along the vertical scale, we have the spectral density also on a log scale. So in this model of the market, uh, as opposed to fractal replication, which implies a step change like a Sarapinski gasket, the, the model shows that uh, whoops, the model shows that that the Spectral density as a function of frequency is consistent. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And in fact, you can see this line down near the bottom. It continues on. These cycle swings get smaller yet on intraday data. But something happens. And let's play that, that this is daily data. We have this aliasing noise, and it's much, much stronger uh, than the modeled signal. So. There are two things that we have to do. First of all, we just have to avoid 
the cycle ranges but a few octaves away from the highest frequency that we can use. It's called a Nyquist frequency, and on daily data, that's a two-bar sample. So um, the other thing we have to do is to filter this noise down and make it smaller than our signal noise. So uh, it, aliasing noise just flat out swamps our, our signal noise, so we have to get rid of it, and the way we get rid of it is with smoothing filters. And furthermore, most people don't recognize that we have to compensate our indicators for this spectral dilation. It extends continuously, and my shot was finding that it down even down into monthly cycles that we work with for swing trading, uh, it, it plays a big part in our indicators. So uh, let's see how we can filter it. Uh, this uh, chart on the left is a little bit different chart. The vertical scale is in decibels, that is a logarithmic scale. Uh, the horizontal scale is frequency on a linear scale. So the reciprocal of frequency is period. On the right-hand side is the Nyquist frequency, a two-bar cycle. At 0.25, that's a four-bar cycle. At 0.1 frequency, that's a 10-bar period. Well, what I have chosen to do on an EMA is to set the critical period, that is where you're 3 dB down, that's a half power, half power point at minus 3 dB. I set uh, the EMA there, and I find, I calculate its transfer response across all the frequencies of interest here. And by the time I get to the Nyquist frequency, a two-bar cycle, I find that uh, that I only have a 13 dB of rejection. So there's not much filtering going on with, a, with a, a moving average. Now, I can get better filtering at the Nyquist frequency by making a longer moving average. And it does give more rejection at the Nyquist frequency. But I pay a penalty for that. Down at the bottom, you see I get increased lag. The longer the moving average, the more lag I have. Not only that, but I'm moving the attenuation band of the filter into the real signal. So I'm not only attenuating the alias frequencies, I'm also uh, attenuating the real signal uh, frequencies. So the solution to that is my super smoother. Now, what I, now I'll give you a little background. What I did with a super smoother, I started with a real analog filter with real inductors and real capacitors. And I wrote an equation uh, for that filter. Then I did a, and remember, sample data is not the same as, as continuous or analog data. So I had to do a bilinear transformation to end up with a, a digital filter. Once I had a digital filter, then I manipulated a little bit to minimize the lag. And so doing all of that, I have a digital filter called a super smoother. And again, I set the um, uh, critical period at, at uh, a 10 bar period, minus 3 dB. But now it has a sharp rejection and theoretically infinite rejection at the Nyquist frequency. So what I have done is um, for all the signals less uh, that have a period longer than 10 bars, they're basically unattenuated, but I've addressed uh, the aliasing noise directly and knock it down substantially. I basically eliminate it uh, with the super smoother. Now, I know there's a tendency in in uh, technical analysis to have a secret and and uh, uh, say I, I it's the holy grail and all of that. But my father said, you got to put the hay where the cows can get it. So here we go. This is the code to compute uh, the super smoother. Now put your pencils down because Mike is, is uh, archiving this, so you get it from Big Mike. Or uh, there's a white paper on stockpotter.com. You can always access uh, these equations. So it's more important that you listen and understand what's going on rather than copying the code down. So what I do uh, here is I, I have two variables um, that I call A1 and B1. They're tuned, in this case, to a critical frequency of a 10-bar cycle. 
and I use A1 and B1 to calculate the um, coefficients C1, C2, and C3. And these are coefficients in the filter itself. So here's the expression uh, to compute the super smoother itself. I call the variable filt, and um, it's simply coefficient number one times the average of today's close and the close one bar ago, plus C2 times the value of filter that I computed one bar ago, and C3 times the value of filter that I computed two bars ago. So this reuses old calculations and it's called a recursive filter. So when you go to use this, several things are you need to bear in mind. This is a code fragment and you have to do declaration of variables and all that housekeeping stuff that, that uh, programming requires. And you have to do something with it after you create the filter. But if you're converting this to other languages, this is done in easy language um, for uh, TradeStation. If you're doing it for other languages, uh, here's the things to know and note. First of all, uh, I have set and fixed uh, the critical frequency at 10 bars. You can change that if you choose. You can even make that an input variable uh, to make it adaptive uh, to any input you choose. TradeStation computes the angular um, argument of cosine functions and sine functions in degrees. So if, if you're in another language like C++ that uses radians, you want to take 180 and substitute pi for that. 3.1419 and, and so on. And again, the notation in easy language is the square brackets uh, with a number in it means the value of that variable in bars ago, whether it's one or two or so forth. So that's how you would use um, um, the super smoother uh, in your code and uh, We'll show some applications a little further on. So using the super smoother solves the problem of aliasing noise. So let's move on and attack uh, spectral dilation. Here is a sample of some data uh, I just kind of arbitrarily chose. And I applied a one pole uh, high pass filter. That means I made it an oscillator, or I detrended it. Um, uh, and I also uh, used a super smoother on it, and the result I got is shown by the red line. Classical oscillators like stochastics or RSIs or CCIs are the equivalent of one pole filters. And, and so what that means is their effective uh, attenuation rate is 6 dB per octave. Well, spectral dilation means that the data itself is increasing at 6 dB per octave. So if your data is increasing at 6 dB per octave and your high-pass filter is attenuating it at 6 dB per octave, the best you can do is condition the data or flatten the spectrum out. You're not gaining on it. And the end result is what you see here. The red line during this long protracted uptrend has an offset. It doesn't have a zero mean. And so um, uh, what's happening is that, that those longer uh, cycle components are leaking through that high-pass filter and causing a, an offset in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the mean of the oscillator. So think of it as, as just data leakage uh, through the skirt of the filter. So we can improve that by at going to a two-pole high-pass filter. Now that means that the spectral dilation is increasing at 6 dB per octave. By going to a two-pole high-pass filter, we're attenuating at 12 dB per octave. So we're attenuating more in our filter than the data is increasing. And here's the result. The uh, red dotted line that you see here is the original one back on the previous chart. And the blue line in, uh, is uh, the output of the two-pole uh, high-pass filter. 
notice that we've removed that offset and we have established a nominally zero mean in the oscillator. And furthermore, note that the zero crossings have generally moved to the left. That is, we've taken out a lot of the lag that's induced um, by, the, uh, um, by the longer cycle components. And you can all still see, uh, you can correlate the peak uh, of the indicator. The lag is not much. Here is a valley, tends to peak up right here. Here's a little valley, uh, a little peak right here. And uh, we start to go up. And now this kind of rolls off a little bit, even though the protracted up move here. And that's simply because we set the, the uh, pass band of the two-pole high pass at 48 bars. And that means it's starting to filter out some of those longer components that we want in this extended run. We really want to keep those. So we might, if we're uh, massaging our indicator, we might want to in increase that 48-bar uh, uh, period a little bit. Anyway. Uh, the net effect is that we establish a true zero mean on the indicator. So um, I'm going to put the hay where the house can, uh, where the cows can get it again. Here is a roofing filter code. Um, I start the code by computing alpha one, that is uh, calculated using a 48 bar uh, critical period. And I, when I use alpha 1, I create uh, the variable uh, HP, which stands for high pass uh, filter. So the high pass filter is uh, the quantity 1 minus alpha 1 over 2, the quantity squared times the quantity closed today, minus 2 times the closed yesterday, plus 2 times the closed two bars ago, plus, now here's where the two pole come in, that's recursive. Um, a 2 times the quantity 1 minus alpha 1 times the value of high pass that I computed one bar ago minus, uh, minus uh, the quantity 1 minus alpha 1 squared times the value of high pass that I computed two bars ago. And I'm ignoring the startup issues. So the high pass is, is uh, computed. Then I simply take that and compute uh, a super smoother on the high pass. So I, this is the same high pass you saw before, instead, except I'm, instead of using the closes, the average of the closes, I'm using the averages of the two high passes. So now we have a roofing filter. What roofing means is that I've got a high pass filter on one side of the spectrum. I've got a low pass filter on the other side of the spectrum, knocking out the aliasing noise. So I blocked out a segment of the spectrum that I'm interested in working with with my indicator. So all I have to do now is to follow uh, the roofing filter with, an, with another indicator of my choice. It might be a stochastic, it might be an RSI, or other custom indicators. It, it, and roofing means that you're roofing, you're putting a roof of the spectrum over the indicator that you're trying to compute. So Again, to interpret what's going on, it's in color here. So uh, the uh, critical frequency for the high pass filter is 48 bars. That's one that I find it works. It's just a little more than two months on daily data. Uh, the arguments uh, of the cosines and the sines are in degrees. So you've got to replace 360 with 2 pi if you're going to other, um, other languages. And the notation of square brackets with a number in it is the value of that variable um, in bars ago. So that's all there is uh, to a roofing uh, filter code. And now let's see how we can apply it in a practical kind of way. The first thing I'm going to do in the first subgraph is a conventional stochastic. A conventional stochastic is computed um, as the current close minus the lowest close over the observation period. That difference means it's a one-pole filter. It's a one-pole high pass. That makes it an oscillator. And, and uh, so you know its roll off is 6 dB per octave. Remember, spectral dilation, the, the 
data is increasing at the rate of 60 B per octave. So uh, the other part of a conventional stochastic is uh, that uh, it's normalized uh, to the highest close minus the lowest close over the observation period. So it swings between basically between 0 and 1. You can scale that to 0 to 100 if you choose. And, and uh, the father of the stochastic was uh, George Lane. And I, I remember George. He was a bombastic speaker. And he would give you numbers of, of interpretations of how to deal with the stochastic. It depended upon this and that, whether the, the percent D crossed the percent K on the right side or the left side. And if it was stuck up against the upper uh, level like it tends to do, you'd wait until it dropped below the 80% point for the third time and before you went short and, and so on. Well, <clears throat> frankly, those interpretations are just plain silly. What's happening is you got spectral dilation leakage that, that throws a, a non-zero mean into the oscillator. And simply, it's, it's stuck up against the top rail here because it's, you've got an upgoing market. And, and if you're trying to uh, buy the dips or something like that, you've got distortion built into your indicator that's difficult to interpret. So what I, oh, by the way, my conventional stochastic, I just did that simple calculation and then I smoothed it uh, with, a smooth, with a super smoother rather than a moving average. I never use moving averages as smoothers. I always use the super smoother. It's just as easy and it gives you far better filtering. Okay, so. Um, when I put the roofing filter in front of the stochastic, now I restore the zero mean in the swings of my oscillator. And I have clarity of interpretation. This dip in the price is a low in the indicator. This kind of broad um, peak in the price corresponds to the peak in the indicator. This little dip in the indicator corresponds to this dip. This peak, broadly ranged, uh, uh, goes along with the peak it's reached here, and then kind of goes flat. So that's indicated by a fallback to the low side. Another peak lines up with this indicator. A low right here falls on the low. And then we get into that run-up. Now we have the same thing that we had before with, with, with a uh, um, two-pole low-pass filter. It's set at 48, and so it's going to, when you get into this longer kind of run, it's got to filter out that. So it's going to roll off a little early, but then we pick up the peak here and so on. So now with this clarity, we have an indicator with a zero mean that we can kind of bank on the swings. Um, we can buy on dips in an up, uptrend, uh, or if the market's sideways, we can treat, go both long and short as we choose. Now, conventional wisdom would have you trade the, um, the oscillator as follows. You wait until, uh, I'm here in the middle of May, you wait until the oscillator swings up and crosses over the 20% mark before confirmation. You want to make sure it's going in the way that you think it's going. So, and that works out when you work into a swing. Or here's another case. Wait until it reaches a 20% point, then you make your buy, and you, so you're waiting for confirmation. And if you want to go short, you wait till it turns down and crosses under the 80% mark, and then it's uh, more reliable. All that sounds very uh, nice, but here's what happens when I take that very same stochastic and apply it over 10 years of uh, the S&P futures on daily data. It's, it's a consistent loser. Well, that is disconcerting to most folks. Now, this is, this is not a trading system. I simply applied that 20 and 80% rule that I just told you indiscriminately without any other rules, and this is what I got for my equity curve. So let's analyze what's going on here. First of all, it's gonna, there's about two bars of lag in, in uh, 
computing the super smoother. You got another approximate two bars of lag um, when you're computing the stochastic. And then after you get the signal, it, there's a, you don't get in until the open of the next bar. So that's a, one more bar of lag. So you got a total just in computational lag. You've got a five bar lag. And uh, to add to that, uh, by the time you go past the price bottom and you cross up above the 20% uh, mark, you've got about another three bar lag. So that's a total of eight bar lag from the true um, minimum in the price action. Well, if you have a monthly cycle, which a lot of stocks have, because companies have to make their numbers on a monthly basis, that means you got, in general, a 10 bar swing up and a 10 bar swing down. So if you're eight bars late on a 10 bar sw uh, swing, you've only got two bars of that swing, and furthermore, you're going eight bars in the opposite direction before you get out the opposite way. It's guaranteed loser. And that's what's reflected here in this curve. But we can fix that, and we can fix it really, really easy. And here's how. Well, I'll go backwards now. Instead of, of waiting for confirmation, since we have confidence in our indicator, we're going to buy right here when the indicator is crossing down below 20% in anticipation of going through a, a cyclic low. And we will sell short here when it crosses above 80% in anticipation of reaching a cyclic high. And here, when it crosses below 20% in anticipation of this low, we'll buy before the turning point. Now what happens, instead of every day being a loser, um, what happens is that we have our five bars of computational lag, but now we subtract out that three bars, we're anticipating a turning point, and so we, we're working with, uh, on the average, maybe a two bar lag in our indicator. And so if we apply my new rule, anticipating a turning point uh, on that same ES data, simple indicator, no, this is not a trading system, just applying the indicator and some blind rules, we get this result. It's amazing. And I haven't done anything more than, than apply a super smoother filter to get rid of the aliasing noise. I've applied a two bar, uh, two pole uh, high pass filter to complete uh, the roofing filter and I simply apply that before I use the stochastic and I use the rules, the anticipate rules that I just described to you. So now we have a predictive indicator and it, it gets a little more complicated I suppose. Uh, I wrote a paper that I got the Charles Dow Award for a couple years ago from the MTA uh, involving uh, probability distributions and, and it gets into that kind of thing. A little more complicated, uh, but it's just basically back up uh, for the simple idea that I just showed you. Anticipate the turning points. And that's the basic idea of productive systems. So uh, in StockSpotter, um, we don't use an R, uh, stochastic or RSI. Uh, we have uh, two indicators. One is right here, it's called Mesa Cycle. And we use a second uh, called Mesa Momentum. Uh, two things I'd like you to notice about these indicators. First, they are very smooth. And second, they have a nominally zero mean. So they've gotten the uh, aliasing noise removed, and they have co been compensated for uh, the spectral dilation. So the swing setup goes like this. The uh, cyclic trough is designated by a green bar, a cyclic high is designated by a red bar. And so you can see it swing back and forth. And, and so a swing, and, and further notice that the momentum, like a lot of indicators, there's a lag 
between the bottom, the trough here, of, of the cycle indicator and the momentum indicator. So we have to have two conditions to make a long uh, trade, uh, long swing trade setup. And that is we have to be at or have experienced a cycle trough within the last bar or so. And the Mesa momentum has to be descending or at a minimum. So we have, in this case, it's, it's descending. We have a swing setup. Look at that. Notice that it, um, I, I won't go into exit rules right now, but, but we're at a peak here. Now, at this minimum, um, uh, we have a trough and the momentum decreasing, so we have a swing setup. At this point, we have a cycle trough, but we don't have a MESA a momentum uh, minimum or decreasing, and so that is not a setup. Again, um, at, at this point, we have um, a cycle uh, trough and a decreasing momentum, so that's a setup. Here's another one, cycle setup, a cycle minimum, and a decreasing MESA momentum. This is not a cherry pick chart. You can go to stockspotter.com, pick any symbol of, you, of your choice, pick any time frame of your choice, and just see how the swing setup works. Um, it's all free, uh, and uh, you can use it and, uh, freely. Also, we have some screeners that show trending conditions, etc. And all of this, the uh, setup analyzers and indicators are free on Stockspotter. But we do sell signals uh, that and, and our premium service that are comprised, and they start with with these swing setup signals. So once we've gotten our signals and have hypothetical trades, how do we document uh, our performance? I think the best way to do it is with uh, a Monte Carlo analysis. So here's what I do. On Stockspotter, we have about 5,000 stocks and we look at all the trades that we've called over the last two and a half years. That means we have tens of thousands of trades. So on those trades, we compute these, um, the profit per day and, and hypothetically drop, write that on a slip of paper. And we drop those slips of paper into the hypothetical hat. So we get a, an ability to do a random pick. And we pick these slips of paper, electronically, of course. We pick them out of the hat one at a time. We read the profit per, dra per day, put the slip back, make another drawing, and we take 260 drawings, and that comprises one year's worth of trading. And so we have synthesized one randomly one year's worth of trading. Then we start do that whole process again and again and again. We repeat it 5,000 times. So in essence, what we have done is randomly simulated 5,000 years worth of trading using real signals over the last two and a half years. So in this case, um, what we did, assuming that you have uh, $10,000 in the market, uh, the most likely, uh, the expectation, this is a Gaussian uh, probability distribution, as you can see, is uh, $4,270 or 42.7%. But as we said in the disclaimer, you can lose money. The probability analysis also shows you have a 13% of chance of not making money over the year. Uh, Actually, uh, that may scare you, but that's a pretty good percentage. And uh, looking on the good side, um, there is about a 32% chance of making almost $8,000. And at the two sigma point, that's a 2% chance you can make almost $11,000. So this, this random selection, a random synthesis is a far better way to compute your likelihood of success than a single point calculation like 
uh, risk of ruin or something like that. So um, uh, it's a pretty good way of assessing. Even if you're if you know your profit factor and your percent profitable, and you s synthesize an equity curve, you get quite a variance uh, from one curve to the next. And it's not really statistical. You can just look at a at a synthesized equity curve, and it doesn't tell you much. This tells you uh, with statistics what your probabilities uh, will be. So um, with that, um, I have four things I would like for you to carry in, in your head as you leave. One is that only, only a super smoother can remove aliasing noise. Parent, and also what I'm, goes along with that is you can't look at too short a cycle in your data because your, your real signal data uh, is being swamped by the aliasing noise itself. And so you've got to stay at least a couple octaves above, above your Nyquist frequency. And that means you've got to stay at least above uh, a four-bar cycle and probably an eight-bar cycle you can't even is you're fooling yourself if you try to look at shorter cycles than that because it's just plain noise but even so that noise is there and if you look at real signals you have to knock it down so you can see the signals through the noise uh secondly uh adding uh a two pole uh high pass filter to a super smoother creates a roofing filter now that roofing filter blocks out a, a segment of the spectrum and mitigates the effects of spectral dilation. So you can precede any of your indicators with the roofing filter and uh, get far better uh, oscillators out of it. If you're trading swing signals, this is not trend trading, but if you're trading swing signals, you must anticipate the price turning points to negate the effects computational lag. Computational lag is absolutely unavoidable. All you can do is minimize it. And so you have to have an indicator that's predictive and uh, take your chances with the probability of anticipating those uh, uh, cyclic turning points. And finally, the best way to evaluating uh, a uh, trading strategy uh, is to do a Monte Carlo analysis on it. And then that way you get a statistical measure how well you're doing. So with that, I guess uh, uh, I would invite you to join, uh, take a look at stockspotter.com. Uh, you can noodle around and look at all the indicators for free. Uh, we do sell the trading signals if you're interested in trading stocks uh, to the long side using this swing trading strategy. And if you have any questions, uh, there's my email address. I'm generally in the office between 10 and 5 o'clock uh, every day uh, Pacific time. So uh, give me a call if you so choose. And with Thanks. that, I guess I'm ready for questions, Mike. Thanks, John. I thought it was a really fantastic presentation. I'm sure that it will be very popular on the, on the site. Okay, so if anybody has questions for John, let's get those taken care of now. And then when we're done with that, we'll move on to the uh, autographed books that we're giving away. So let me take a look and see what we have here. Um, Patrick is, is saying that he plays the piano, but he's trying to understand what you mean by octaves. He says, uh, when you say it increases six decibels per octave, does that mean that it plays louder in amplitude, one octave higher on the piano? Uh, Patrick, that is absolutely correct. Uh, six dB per octave means that the wave amplitude doubles when you double the frequency. Okay. Now that's uh, that's quite n not quite the same as 1.618 in the log spiral, but it's close. Uh, so uh, I think there's general agreement uh, on uh, about the discussion of the shape of, of the data. Uh, that uh, every time you double the period, you're going to uh, double the swing amplitude. Now, it goes the other way also. If you're talking about intraday data, um, intraday data will be smaller as you decrease it, as you, as you cut the frequencies in half and half again, then you're going to cut the swing amplitude. 
in half and half again. So it makes trading intraday on a swing cycle basis very, very difficult because you have to wait for the gap openings to get out of your analysis. And uh, you can use uh, equal tick bars and things like that to, to kind of mitigate that. But nonetheless, uh, the swings are pretty small. Uh, the aliasing noise scales according to your sample rate. So if you're sampling on one minute bars, the aliasing noise is going to be a still about a 10 bar uh, period. So um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, Al is asking, is the Mesa volume, sorry, Mesa volume, sorry, let me try that again, is Mesa momentum like relative vigor? He wants to know if it's similar. Hmm. I haven't looked at relative vigor in a long time. That's in my book, Cybernetic Analysis. Um, I would have to say they're probably a lot different. Uh, uh, um, I'd have to compare the code side by side, but I and just on just thinking about it and my memory, uh, I would say that no, they're two different indicators completely. And uh, John, speaking of your books, I heard that you you mentioned at the top that uh, that you said your fifth book and likely your final is coming out soon. So any any particular reason that you've decided to uh, to stop writing? Is it just time? You have no idea what a pain in the neck it is to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I do it and the reason I write, my, uh, 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 I'm primarily a researcher, and I research for my own trading and and. Uh, so I write articles and books primarily to keep myself honest. Um, if I throw it out there for public consumption, uh, it has to be true. You know, I can't fool myself. Um, and and you have to do things to make products uh, than you would do for yourself. And and writing a book, you have to be precise and and uh, not have typos and those kinds of things that you otherwise could get away with. But that's why it's primarily a pain in it. And frankly, I'm laying it all out. I'm br I'm putting the hay so the cattle can get it. Uh, right. I don't have a lot more to say that most traders would be able to digest. I can go into a lot of math, but that's not of much interest to most traders. Right. Okay. I try to make the math that I know, I, I kind of make it applicable to trading directly and do it in a way that I hope that most traders that, that at least do coding can understand it. Great. Well, I think you did an excellent job in the webinar today explaining the math. Um, and just a real quick follow-up on the book. Do you have a title yet for the book that you can share? Or uh, is that yeah, the working title is uh, Cyclic Analysis for Traders. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Patrick asking... If the Mesa signals cycle and momentum are based on the Berg algorithm, the answer uh, is no. They they are dynamic. Uh, the Berg algorithm is basically the algorithm that I use in the Mesa uh, program and have for thirty years. However, um, what I'm doing in the Mesa uh, cycle and Mesa momentum is I'm using some of these exact same filter concepts that I just showed you. Um, I'm I've applied. It's more of a filtering program than a uh, measuring the cycle and applying the cycle to the indicator. Matt asking instead of using the close, what if you were to use a weighted close, such as the high plus the low times uh, two times the close divided by four. Any comment or opinion on that? Uh, it wouldn't make any difference. I, I, in the old days, I used to think uh, that uh, there was a little less aliasing noise if, if I used uh, high plus low over two or high plus low plus close over three. Um, but those effects are pretty second order effects. It's sample data is sample data. You're, you're still getting one sample a day on daily data, and and that's primarily what you have to live with is, is the idea that you've got sample data. This business of aliasing noise comes from the fact of sample data 
not the fact that you have uh, noise in the signal itself so much, which is what I think he was trying to get at. Uh, the noise in the signal is basically swamped out. It may be there, and you may be able to knock it down with the average, but it doesn't make much difference because it's so small compared to the aliasing noise. Uh, Eric is asking, he says, today you discussed the super smoother and roofing filter, but on your site, stockspotter.com, it shows cycle and momentum. Are they related? Which, which one is which? They're related, of course. Yes. As, as I said earlier, um, uh, uh, the Mesa momentum and the Mesa cycle are, are identifiable by two characteristics. They've got a zero mean, nominally, and they're very smooth. So that means I'm applying my advanced filter techniques to both remove the effects of spectral dilation and to remove the effects of, of uh, aliasing noise. Um, so I, I forgot the question. Well, he's just asking if there is a different formula or if it's the same, just with a different name. It's basically the same. You know, I, I, uh, I, I have, I put some Kentucky windage on it, frankly, um, <laughs> and it gets into the, now you're into the uh, uh, realm of, uh, of, of trade secrets and proprietary data sure. uh, that, that work that much better than uh, for us at Stockspotter. But one thing that you mentioned that I think is very important to, to reiterate is that what you've provided, I mean, a lot of indicators such as stochastic, like you mentioned, rely on some type of a moving average. So if you take your custom or proprietary base indicator, whether it's similar to RSI, stochastic, whatever, and replace it with the super smoother or the, the, uh, the high pass, then it, you know, that the roofing filter, then you're, you're, you're doing what you just talked about that you did on your site, right? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, there, there's lots of applications. For example, if you want to make uh, an MACD, an MACD is just a, 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 a collection of exponential moving averages. Well, you can tune the super smoother and have several different smooth, smoothing um, uh, settings, and you can make an MACD out of two or three super smoothers. You can make a CCI. Uh, work better by preceding it with a with a uh, with a roofing filter, for example. Yeah, you can do lots of things right. um, to standard indicators and make them work. Just make them stand up and salute uh, right. by comparison to the conventional way that they're computed. So it can be used as a price proxy because instead of using close uh, for an indicator, you could perhaps use this roofing filter. Exactly. You'd use that out, that variable filt instead of close. Right. Uh, Frank's asking, and I picked up on this as well, at the end here you said that uh, the signals that you provide uh, uh, for a premium on your website, you said, said that they were long signals. Does that mean that you only are interested in trading longs? Yes, because Stockspotter is a commercial product and very, very few people in, in, in the retail market trade stocks to the short side. If they want to trade something to the short side, the market is full of ETFs, inverse ETFs, right. and inverse multiple ETFs. Right. So uh, if, you can, if you don't want to trade, uh, oh, I forgot the symbol. Um, right, but you can you can go long. Uh, and like, trade, yeah. Trading uh, uh, the SPY, you can trade, what is it, SO SP or something? SPXU, I think, is one, like an ultra short. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you go along uh, so the ETF, which is really short the market. You can use the signals to trade an inverse ETF if you want, if you want to go that way. Right. Well, let's see. Bob's saying that he tested the roofing filter with a 48 bar followed by a 24, 24 bar sine wave. And he says that he needed to drop the high pass period to 24 to reduce the 48 period amplitude to half of the 24 bar period. In order to get the correct compensation, should we be using a lower period for the high-pass filter? Um, if you're using the roofing filter as a standalone indicator, you can both tune the super smoother uh, um, to a longer period and tune the two-pole 
a high pass to a lower and get a band pass that's more narrow. Uh, so if you have an idea that you only want to trade the monthly cycle, for example, a 20 bar cycle, you might set, uh, for example, you could set the super smoother to 18 and set the two pole high pass to 24. And that would give you a a fairly narrow bandwidth uh, um, band pass filter that would only filter through the monthly cycle. Now there is another way to do it, and it'll be in my book, which is called a band pass filter. You you can get that all in one shot. But the difference is, if you have an independent high pole, high pass, and low pass filter, that's the energy storage in the filter is less and it will tend to ring out. That is, it'll have a better uh, transient response than a bandpass filter will, an explicit bandpass. So I like uh, the tunability, the independent tunability of, of a super smoother and a two-pole high pass. To, gives me lots of flexibility in, in uh, judging what segment of the spectrum I want to look at. Okay, and let me ask a layman's question. So, your the roofing filter and the super smoother being uh, two pole. I've seen other uh, indicators, like I think Butterworth, for example, where there's three poles. Can you talk about what the effect would be and what your comment is on the difference between the two and the three? Sure. Um, uh, the simply it's lag. Uh, you get it's a trade-off of filtering versus lag, and the more poles you add, the more lag you're going to get. And furthermore, the more poles you had, the more these are recursive filters, and so the more poles you have, the more the lag will vary across the passband, and and so you get uh, an effect of of distortion across the passband uh, that is basically undesirable. So you can maintain um, the, the fidelity, as it were, of, of the waveform best with using as few uh, poles as possible, which is two, um, rather than adding on more poles. Okay. Eric asking... I know I had three poles in, in, in one of my books, and, and basically I've gotten away from that simply because it's uh, those reasons. It, it in, in induces distortion and in, in, in induces lag that I find undesirable. Okay. Uh, Eric's asking, he says, what have you found to be the best indicator besides stochastics for using the roofing filter? Whoa. Um, well, I have... I have multiple uh, best. <laughs> uh, that's tough. Uh, a stochastic has two bars of lag, and I don't like it uh, for that reason. Uh, and most indicators do have lag in them. Um, um, on stock spotter, you'll also see a whole host of of things I call swami charts, which show you as a heat map. Um, the, how the filter is portrayed as you change the filter characteristic. And, uh, and so I really like to watch that heat map. It, it let, let gives me confirmation and, and fast action at the same time. But you've got to stare at it and look at it for a while to, uh, to be able to read it, I think. Um, but I find it to be a pretty neat device. Okay. Um, uh, Dieter asking, uh, going back to the Monte Carlo analysis, he's asking, what was the underlying of the trades that you used? Was it the S&P or was it various stocks? And he's also asking over what period was a sampling taken? I think that you said it was one year, right? Uh, I'm going to, can you still see my screen? Yes. Are we talking about that screen there? Uh, I believe it was the Monte Carlo analysis. Oh, this. Yeah, there we oh, go. Oh, um, Monte Carlo, I was using all of our hypothetical trades, because we, we deal in hypotheticals, um, 
over a two and a half year period. We trade 5,000 stocks and ETFs, so there were tens of thousands of trades involved. Okay, gotcha. To make that 5,000 year simulation. Okay, uh, let's see. Patrick, uh, I think that you gave. I, I would like to comment that even though, you know, you have the statistic, it's well possible to get three, four, or maybe even five losing trades in a row. Uh, right. As you know, coin flips uh, don't prove a whole lot about statistics. Uh, you, you can get extended runs once in a while. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, so this is a statistical measure, and and you still can get uh, serial losers. Um, so don't get me wrong about this is a way to evaluate your expectation. Uh, earlier you talked about, I think at the top of the presentation, you talked about aliasing and you gave a example of it. Uh, Patrick is asking if you could give a different example of what aliasing is. Mm. Okay. Um, in sample data, uh, the Nyquist frequency is theoretically the highest frequency that you can can use and that means that you have to have at least two samples per cycle for it to be a true rendering of sample data so let's suppose um, um, we are sampling a, a something is swinging over a and we get four samples per per uh, per complete cycle, and then overlay on that another sine wave, where we uh, you know I have to ask you to draw this out. Just draw a relatively fast acting sine wave, and then draw a really slow sine wave uh, over it. They'll cross, and if you put on an even sample, that longer uh, wave could be uh, uh, replicated by the sampling process. It samples it correctly, even, uh, but uh, it will be incorrect because uh, it's on the. We don't have at least two samples every cycle, and, and that's where you get into this effect. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I can talk about aliasing in a mathematical sense, uh, but it's way beyond, I think, what most traders want to talk about. He gets into things like negative frequencies. Uh, 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 James is... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I think I wanted to let that one drop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, I'll leave it uh, to Wikipedia. Look it up in Wikipedia what aliasing is. Uh, James, uh, you'll is, see it. You'll sorry. see it there. James is asking uh, about uh, opinions of other non-parametric estimation techniques like Eurix JMA, which is a, a popular uh, commercial product as a price proxy. He says that it seems that you can achieve more optimal estimates with minimum lag and noise. So that's basically what you're doing here with the roofing filter. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I. Uh, couldn't comment on Eurek's work. Uh, I I know kind of, sort of, uh, by reverse engineering what he's doing. Uh, but he does what he does, and he does it well, by the way. <laughs> um, it's just uh, uh, it, it gets into the way that the filters are constructed. And uh, I have shown you my way, and uh, uh, Mark can comment more on his product than I can. I can I can certainly say that your way is what, like five lines of code and, and his way is much much more. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's a trade secret, isn't it? It is, so, but there's there's been some, like you said, some reverse engineer techniques. There's even one posted on the site that somebody, you know, came up with their own variation and it's quite complex uh, compared to Yeah, I, I wouldn't attempt to, to reverse engineer his his stuff. Uh, Ken's asking uh, if you would mind sharing what your research topic was for your PhD. Um, it had had uh, um, it was nonlinear wave movement in in 
a semiconductor. It was pretty esoteric stuff. I didn't do anything with it. <laughs> we're getting towards the end of the question, so I just want to remind everybody that as soon as we're done, we'll give away those books. Um, let me take a look and see which ones we've not already answered. Uh, Soren is asking if you can comment on the super smoother when it goes flat in a trending market. Um, I mean, from what I saw on the oscillator you're, and what you mentioned in your uh, very, very simple trading system example was if, it, if the market was trending up, then you would simply buy on the way down before it reached the, the valley, right? Sure. Uh, actually, it is a two-pole filter that's more at play here in those extended runs up, and that says when I set it at 48, I'm really looking at trading a monthly cycle kind of thing, and I don't care for cycle periods that go on for more than two months. But if he wants to see a run-up like we've had in the S&P you know, over the last year, there are periods where it keeps going for maybe three or four months in a row. Uh, then what you do is instead of 48, uh, you might set uh, that uh, uh, you want to extend the high-pass filter. You might put 100 in there or 200. You know, uh, or if you basically want to take it out of the equation, you can keep it in in the code, but just set the variable to a thousand, and all it does then is remove the, the static term. Uh, and you're looking at all the cycles, uh, the longer cycles. So you can, if you're interested in in longer runs, you need to make uh, the critical period in the two-pole high-pass filter bigger. Yeah, another comment from Eric saying that uh, in the in your book, uh, Cybernetics, you mentioned that he says you showed an instantaneous trend formula and a mm -hmm. formula for a cycle that combined. Uh, they said they were pretty much the pretty much the full price signal. Does your super smoother and roofing filter combination replace that pair of formulas? I did that a different way. Um, yeah, I've written papers on on how to get the trend signal out of. Uh, you, you basically do a moving average and then subtract that moving average from the price, and then you do a moving average on on or, or a filtering uh, of, of that difference, uh, which is a way of removing, you're taking a difference again, and so you're removing the low frequency component and refiltering, and so your the second refilter doesn't carry the baggage of the longer cycles. And, and basically what the roofing filter does, it does it in a more computationally efficient manner. That is, it does it all in one shot instead of multiple steps of, of filtering and taking a difference and then refiltering. Uh, let's see. Uh, Koss uh, is asking. As I review what I said, uh, that's got to be. Sorry, go ahead. I said, as I review that explanation in my head, that's got to be confusing <laughs> <laughs> without reading the book. Um, but maybe that answers Eric's question. Uh, let's see. Koss is saying that or asking if you can do filters with digital sampling techniques. Yes, that's what these are. Right. These are these are discrete. Uh, uh, these are, uh, the general process is uh, digital signal processing, and these are digital uh, filters. Uh, the opening chapter of my new book, I get into an overview of filter theory for traders and explaining um, uh, what filters are and how to define their transfer characteristics. And, and so you kind of need that background uh, to understand filters. And uh, so in the new book, uh, that'll be there, and I think it'll make... Uh, uh, filters comprehensible to many traders. Okay. Looks like about three questions left. Bob's asking, is the roofing filter a better way to smooth and detrend the data uh, going into your published spectral methods? Rather than what? 
he didn't give an example of, of rather than. He's just asking uh, if it's a, a better way to smooth and detrend based on what you've published uh, prior, is my assumption. Yes, this is new stuff. <laughs> this, I'm, what I'm showing you is the most recent output of my research. Okay. So, you know, I've done things along the line another way. It wasn't as efficient. Uh, but this is up-to-date and unpublished material. Gotcha. Okay. So this is the newest stuff that I have out of my research. Uh, let's see. BP is asking, is there a, a website where you can find your papers that you've published? Yes. If you go to stockspotter.com uh, and in the menu bar at the top on the right-hand side, there is a, a, a selection called resources. And so I have videos there and white papers and PowerPoint presentations, all of which are available in StockSpotter. Okay, so I think that uh, this next question will make it the last one, and then we'll move on to the book giveaway. Charles is asking about different types of charts, volume charts, tick charts, time charts, equidestant charts, uh, or equivolume charts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of uh -huh. people use range charts because they think that it, uh, you know, makes makes everything smooth. Any comment on what type of input is best for, you know, these uh, these indicators that you've provided today? I think I would leave that to 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 the user. Uh, whatever works. Uh, for example, if you're trading intraday and there's a whole lot of volatility. Uh, and a whole lot of volume going on in the first hour that the market opens. So if you're using equi tick charts, what you're doing is it's a way of getting the gap openings out of the way, and so you're looking at more consistent data so you can start trading the second hour on during a day. That that would be a case where equi tick might work better than than uh, than one minute or five minute or fifteen minute bars. Um, the rest of it, uh, range bars or that kind of thing, um, it's just a way of taking the sample data. Uh, I haven't done it, so I don't know in that context exactly how the aliasing noise would fold in. But from what I've seen, aliasing noise is just directly uh, scaled uh, to your sample rate. And so whatever you're using it's you're still going to have like 10 bar a 10 bar cycle or shorter is basically to be neglected and overlooked but you still got to filter it out so that so that the data uh, uh the, the signal in the rest of the data is able to come through uh so i'm assuming that that kind of scaling for aliasing noise is the same Regardless of what kind of what kind of uh, nonlinear sampling you're using. Okay, uh, and John, can you throw up that last slide one more time with the contact info? So if there's anybody that had any further questions, they could uh, maybe contact you there. Sure. There you go. Okay. Uh, feel free to call me. Um, I'm available by uh, email. Okay. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. So thanks, John. Uh, John, if you if you want, you can go ahead and, and, and go. It's up to you. But I'm going to take back control, and then I'm going to uh, throw up the uh, quiz questions to give away 10 autographed copies of John's book. And give me just one second, and I'll do that. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Okay. All right, so we have uh, 10 books to give away today, and they will be autographed by John. Uh, the, the book is uh, Mesa and Trading Market Cycles. Um, hopefully we can also have John back a little bit later this year after his new book and uh, possibly his last book comes out, and we'll try to do that again. The, uh, the, the questions are based on today's content. Um, I will be asking the winners for their BMT username, so if you don't have one, you can go to BigMyTrading.com and click on register. It's free. It takes about 30 seconds. And that way I'll contact you once the webinar is done and get all the information I need from you. 
uh, to get the book into your hands. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the first question. Actually, let me get the answers ready. Okay. All right, here's the first question. What noise swamps market cycles? Okay. Wow. That was immediately uh, apparent. People already got that one right. So the, uh, the answer is aliasing noise and Ken. Ken V, I need your uh, username, please. Okay, let me write that down. Okay, going to the second question. What is the longest cycle period that requires a filter to remove aliasing noise? Okay, we have the correct answer. Uh, the answer is 10 bar period. Ari, Ben, I need your username, please. <clears throat> Ari just needs your username. Okay, I am, I still don't have the username, so I'm going to just move on, and hopefully you can get that to me shortly, Ari. All right, question three. If a market cycle period is doubled approximately, how large is its amplitude swing? Okay, uh, Jim Watt, the answer is doubled. So, Jim, I need your BMT username, please. And Ari, no, I, I mean uh, not your email address, but the uh, the username on my site, Big Mike Trading. That's what I need to contact you. And, Jim, I need that from you as well. Okay. And question four, <clears throat> the market is fractal. What does Ellers call this effect? Okay, we have the answer. Good job, Lawrence. Lawrence uh, needs your BMT username, and the answer is spectral dilation. Okay, let me write that down. Okay, question five. What filter best removes aliasing noise? Okay, we have a winner. Oleg, I need your BMT username, please. And the answer is super smoother. Okay. Going to question six. What filter mitigates spectral dilation? Okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff H. Jeff H. I need your BMT username, please. And the answer is roofing filter. Okay. Going to number seven. What filter produces a zero mean in an oscillator indicator? Okay, I have the answer. Greg, I need your BMT username, please. And the answer is a roofing filter again. Uh, guys, for the for those of you asking about getting a username, it, you just go to bigmiketrading.com and you click on register. It should be uh, on the top left. And you'll fill out a real quick form and that'll get you the username. It's free. Okay, Greg. All right, going to question eight. What trading action makes an indicator predictive? So we're looking for something that, looking for an action. There we go. There we go. Peter got it. 
Peter, I need your BMT username, please. And the answer is anticipating turning points. Okay. Going to uh, question nine. What is the best way to analyze trading system performance? And there we go. You guys were on the ball. Glenn, Glenn, I need your username, please. This reminds me of uh, yesterday's webinar where the questions were, or the answers were coming in instantaneously. Uh, so the answer is Monte Carlo analysis. Okay, Glenn, let me write that down. Okay, here's the uh, final question. What is the name of John's new website? Got it. Got it. Uh, BP? BP, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. All right, so congratulations to uh, the guys that won one of the 10 autographed books today. And I will get a hold of you uh, on BMT. For those of you that, that did not get me your username, uh, I'll just email you. So look for an email from me, and then we'll get that taken care of. So I want to thank John one more time for his time to put together the presentation and for his time to answer everybody's questions today. Thank you, John. And I would hope to invite you back as soon as your new book is released. If you don't mind coming back, that would be fantastic. So thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. I'll post the recording on BMT sometime later today, and you'll also find it on YouTube. Uh, for those that came from, uh, from John's uh, mailing list, I will send a copy to John so we can send it to you guys. Thanks, guys.